pleasure to have you. Well, th thank you very much, and I note that a lot of your readers have come to our site, and I appreciate it. Yeah, we, well, we've got some, some great readers, and they're interested in knowing uh, the truth as best they can find it, and uh, we have a, a way of being at our site, which is uh, we really like to keep our facts very separated from our opinions, something I, I really admire that you do as well. Well, thanks. So uh, let's briefly review, you know, if we could just very quickly synopsize, I think you can do this better than anybody. What happened at Fukushima? You know, what, what happened, in, and, and I really would like to take the opportunity to uh, um, talk about this kind of specifically, like, like where we are with each one of the reactors. So, so first of all, th this disaster, um, how did it happen? Was it just, was it bad engineering? Was it, was it really bad luck uh, with the tsunami? How did, this, how did this even initiate? Something we were told again and again, something that couldn't happen, seems to have happened. Well, the, the one little bit of physics here is that even when a reactor shuts down, it continues to churn out heat. Now, not, now only 5% of the original amount of heat, but you know, when you're cranking out uh, millions of horsepower of heat, 5% is still a lot. So you have to keep a nuclear reactor cool after it's shut down. Now, what happened at Fukushima was um, it, it went into what's called a station blackout. And, and people plan for that. Um, they, that means there's no power to anything except for batteries. And batteries can't turn the massive motors that are required to cool the nuclear reactor. So the plan is in a station blackout that somehow or other you get power back in, um, in four or five hours. Um, that didn't happen at Fukushima because the, um, the, the tidal wave, the tsunami, was so great that um, it overwhelmed their, their um, diesels and it overwhelmed something called service water too. But in any event, they couldn't get any power to the big pumps. Now, was it foreseeable? They were prepared for a seven-meter tsunami, about 22 feet. Um, the tsunami that hit was, was something in excess of 10 and quite likely 15 meters, so somewhere between 35 and 45 feet. They were warned that the tsunami that they were designed against was too low. They were warned for at least 10 years, and, and I'm sure there were people back before that. So. Would they have been prepared for one this big? I don't know, but certainly they were unprepared for um, even a tsunami of lesser magnitude. So the tsunami came came along and just swamped the systems. And uh, I, I heard that you know there were some other design elements there too, such as potentially there there were um, the generators were were in an unsafe spot, or that maybe some of their electrical substations all happened to be in the basement. Um, so so they kind of they kind of got taken out all at once. Now here's what I heard was you know that the, the initial reports when they came out they said oh no, nothing to fear. Um, they all went into scram, which is some sort of emergency shutdown, and and they said everything scrammed. And I knew that we were in trouble within less than 24 hours. They talked about how they were pumping seawater in, which I assume by the time you're pumping seawater, you, you, you have a pretty clear indication from the outside that there's something really quite wrong with this story. Is that true? Uh, yes. Uh, seawater and um, as anybody who's ever had a boat on the ocean would know, you know, salt water and stainless steel do not get along very well. And salt water and stainless steel at 500 degrees don't get along very well at all. Um, and then uh, you're right, they had some single points of vulnerability, you know, the, the hole in the armor. Um, the diesels were one of them, but even if the diesels were up high, they would have been in trouble because of those service water pumps I talked about. And they got wiped out, and those pumps are the pumps that cool the diesels. So even if the diesels were runnable, the cooling water that runs through the diesels would have been taken out by the tsunami mm -hmm. anyway. So it's kind of a, a, a false argument that it, to blame to blame the diesels. Okay, so so take us through. So reactor number one, um, you know, it, it was revealed I think about a week ago now that that they finally came to to the revelation that I think some of us had come to independently uh, that there'd been something more than than a, a partial meltdown, maybe even a complete meltdown. What what's your assessment of reactor one, and where is it right now? When you see hydrogen explosions, that means that the outside of the fuel has exceeded. 2,200 degrees, and the inside is well over 3,500 degrees. The fuel gets um, brittle, it burns, and then it plops to the bottom of the, um, of the nuclear reactor in a molten blob like lava. Um, it was pretty clear to a lot of people, including apparently to the NRC, but they weren't telling people back in March, that that had occurred in Unit 1, that there was essentially um, 
a blob of lava on the bottom of the nuclear reactor. Now, we've got to separate. There's a nuclear reactor, and that is inside of a containment. So there's still one more barrier here. But the problem is that it, the reactor had boiled dry, and they were using fire pumps connected to the ocean to pump um, salt water into the reactor. Now, if this thing were individual tubes, the water could get around the uh, uranium and completely cool it. But when it's a blob at the bottom of the reactor, it can only get to the top surface, and that would cause it to begin the meltdown. Now, on these boiling water reactors, there's about 70 holes in the bottom of the reactor where the control rods come in. And um, I suspect that those holes were essentially the weak link that caused this molten mass. Now it's 5,000 degrees at the center. Even though the outside may be touching water, the inside of this molten mass is 5,000 degrees. Um, it melts through and lays on the bottom of the containment. That's where we are today. We have no... Uh, reactor, um, essentially a big pressure cooker, um, and the molten uh, uranium is on the bottom of the containment. The It spreads out at that point because the floor is flat, and I don't think it's going to melt its way through the, the concrete floor. Um, it may gradually over time, but the damage is already done because the containment has, um, has cracks in it, and it's pretty clear that it's leaking. So you're putting water in the top, and the plan had never been to put water in the top and let it run out the bottom. That is not the preferred way of cooling a nuclear reactor in an accident. But you're putting water in the top, it's running out the bottom, and it's going out through cracks in the containment. After touching directly uranium and plutonium and cesium and strontium, and it's carrying all those radioactive isotopes out as liquids and gases into the environment. Yeah. So, so um, I, this melting that happened, is this just a function of the decay heat at this point in time? We're not speculating that there's been any sort of recriticality or any other, you know, nu what we might call a nuclear reaction. This is just decay heat from the uh, isotopes that are in there from, from prior nuclear activity. Uh, those are just decaying and giving off that heat. That's sufficient to get to 5,000 degrees? Yes. Once the uranium melts into a blob at these low enrichments, 4 or 5%, it can't make a, a new criticality. If there's criticalities occurring on the site, and there might be because there's still iodine-131, which is an indication, it's not coming from the unit one core and it's not coming from the unit two core because those are both blobs at the bottom of the containment. All right, so we have these blobs. They, they've, they've somehow escaped the primary um, reactor pressure vessel, which is that big steel thing, and now they're, they're on the f relatively flat floor of the containment, the concrete piece. And you say Unit 2 is, is roughly the same story as Unit 1. Um, where's Unit 3 in this story, then? Unit 3 may not have melted through, and that means that some of the fuel um, certainly is lying on the bottom, but it may not have melted through. Um, and some of the fuel may still still look like fuel, although it's certainly brittle. Um, and it's possible when the fuel is in that configuration that um, you can get a recriticality. It's also possible in any of the fuel pools, unit one, two, three, and four fuel pool, that you could get a, a criticality as well. So um, there's been frequent enough um, high iodine indications to lead me to believe that either one of the four fuel pools or the Unit 3 reactor is, um, is in fact, every once in a while starting itself up. And, uh, and then it gets to a point where it gets so hot it shuts itself down, and it kind of cycles, it kind of breathes, if you will. Right, so, but it's, it's, when it's doing that breathing, it's, it's certainly generating a lot of heat uh, through the fission process, and then, of course, it's generating more isotopes to decay and c contribute to decay heat at that point. Um, what, what's your assessment if there is that sort of breathing going on? Is this like a little pocket within one of the uh, geometries that exists that would still allow fission to be supported, or could, could you imagine this being a fairly significant amount, or how much do you think might be happening? I think it's a relatively significant amount. You know, maybe uh, a tenth of the nuclear reactor core mm. starts back up and shuts back down and starts back up and shuts back down. And that's an extra heat load. You know, you're not prepared to get rid of one-tenth of a nuclear reactor's heat mm. by pumping water in the top. Now, Unit 3 has another problem, and the NRC mentioned it yesterday for the first time, and it gets back to that salt water and the effect on iron. They're afraid that the reactor bottom will break, 
literally just break right out and dump everything. Um, because it's now hot and it's got salt on it and it's got the ideal conditions for corrosion. So the, the big fear on Unit 3 is that um, it will break at the bottom and whatever else is, remains in it, which could be the entire core, uh, could fall out suddenly. And if that happens, you can get something called a steam explosion. Um, and this may be a one in a hundred chance. I, I don't want your listeners to think it's going to happen tomorrow. But if the core breaks, you will get a steam explosion. But we're not sure the core is going to break. And that's a, that's a violent hydrogen explosion like the one we've already witnessed. Reactor 3 caught me when, when, it, when it blew because what I saw there with my eyes was, was a, a fairly focused upwards, um, very high energy event, which completely looked different from what I saw when, when Unit 1 blew. Um, are you talking about is, is that, or because or, I know you've, you've postulated in the past that you think that um, if there might have been a, what was the name for it, a prompt yeah. criticality? The, the, I called it a prompt criticality that created a detonation. Engineers differentiate. It was a, either way, it's going to be a big explosion. But the violence of Unit 3's explosion, um, and I did some calculations to show that the speed at which it, the, the, the flame traveled, and in order to throw particles as far as this one throw through particles, the speed of that shock wave had to be in excess of 1,000 miles an hour. And, and that's a detonation where the shock wave itself can cause incredible damage. And that can happen if we were to have one of these steam explosions. If the bottom of the reactor in Unit 3 falls out, um, you could have another one of those all over again. And, and uh, obviously a, a not a good thing if that happens. What can they do at this stage, though, if that's a concern they have? Uh, uh, this, sounds, this sounds very tricky to me because if it turns out that, that there's excess heat being generated because we're having this breathing um, recriticality event going on in there, but for whatever reason, let's just say the core of Reactor 3 is pretty hot, um, how, what can they really do beyond um, just keep trying to dump water in there and keep their fingers crossed? Um, well, that's two out of the three things they have to do. <laughs> uh, the, the other one is they can flood it if, if they can flood it from the outside. In other words, put water outside the pressure cooker as well as inside the pressure cooker. Um, they may be able to remove more heat that way and prevent the, 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 the gross failure of the, of the pressure vessel. But really, it's just you know hoping that you can put enough water in. And uh, the other piece of that is, and it relates to Unit 4, too, is, um, is a seismic event. Um, if you put too much water in these reactors, they, they get heavy. And they're not designed to sway when they're as heavy as these things have hundreds of uh, tens of tons of extra water in them. So they're really not designed to sway. So if there's a severe aftershock, um, unit 3 and, um, and Unit 4 are in real jeopardy. And if you remember the, the Sumatra uh, earthquake, that was the 9 plus about three or four years ago, um, the biggest aftershock occurred three months afterward, and that was in 86. So um, aftershocks, uh, even though we're two months into this, um, if the Sumatra event is any indication, aftershocks are still possible. Right, and, and so you mentioned Unit 4 then. Um, also being at risk for this. I, I thought the Unit 4, the, the core was out um, and that the, the, it, they have some water back in the pool. What's the concern with Unit 4 at this point? Um, you're absolutely right. There's no, um, there's no reactor running there. Everything had been taken out and was put in the spent fuel pool. But that means there's no containment either. So the entire uh, spent fuel pool is visible. Literally, when they have those helicopter flyovers, you can look down into this blown out shell of a building and see the, um, the fuel in the spent fuel pool. It's still relatively hot because it only shut down in November. So there's still a lot of decay heat in that pool. Um, Brookhaven National Labs did a study in uh, 1997. And it said that if a fuel pool went dry and caught on fire, um, it could cause 187,000 fatalities. So it's a big concern. Um, and probably the biggest concern, I, I know Chairman Yasko of the NRC said that the reason he told um, uh, Americans to get out from 50 miles out was he was afraid of Unit 4 catching fire, that, that exposed fuel pool would volatilize plutonium, uranium, and cesium, and strontium, um, and um, 
and if the Brookhaven study is to be believed, could could kill you know more than a hundred thousand people as a result. Hmm. And and this from the effects of radiation or long term cancer exposures. Something we'll get into in a minute. Yeah, hot particles uh, from long term cancer exposure. Okay. So so we've had these four units. Each of them has sort of had their own crisis, and each of them has has released um, contamination into the environment first. How much contamination really got released here? Uh, second, you know, we we see that a bunch of it's headed into the ocean, although we're we're still, you know, I think questioning how much is where it all is. So my question is around how much contamination is is around these buildings at this point in time, and and you know what are the challenges, and what happens when not not if but when typhoon season comes up? Say we had a, a sort of a large onshore kind of a storm, you know, would that create sort of issues? I'm just trying to play out how much how much has been released how much might be released and, and what it actually implies at this point in time? Well, this, this event is, um, I've said it's worse than Chernobyl, and I'll, I'll stand by that. Um, there, there was an enormous amount of, um, of radiation given out in um, the first two, two, three weeks of the event. And had the wind been blowing inland, this would be, uh, it could very well have brought the nation of Japan to its knees. I mean, it was... Uh, there's so much contamination that luckily wound up in the Pacific Ocean compared to across the, uh, the the nation of Japan. It could have cut Japan in half, but now the winds have turned, you know. So they're heading to the south toward Tokyo, and uh, you know my concern and my advice to, to friends is that if there's a severe aftershock and the Unit Four building collapses, leave. Um, there's, we're well beyond where any science has ever gone at that point, and uh, nuclear fuel lying on the ground and getting hot is not a, a condition that um, anyone has ever analyzed. So the the, the plants, you'll, you'll see them steaming, and, and as, as the summer goes on, you'll see them steaming less because the air is warmer. But it's not because they're, they're not steaming. You just don't see it because... This event occurred in March, and it was cool there, so you'll see a plume a lot easier. Those um, plants are still emitting um, a lot of radiation, nowhere near as much as on the first two weeks, but a lot of radiation, cesium, strontium, and um, mainly cesium and strontium. Those are going to head south, whether or not there's a, a, a hurricane, tropical hurricane. Um, the wind is going to push it south this time, and uh, so the issue is... Um, not the total radiation you might measure with a Geiger counter in your hand, but um, but hot particles. Well, there was already I, I you know was taken aback when I read the reports that um, in some prefectures right around Tokyo they'd found some what I consider to be pretty hot readings, um, you know three or four thousand becquerels in the soil, one hundred seventy thousand becquerels in in some kind of a fly ash or or they they found some in sludge as well, but I think the higher reading was from some sort of ash, which means it came through an incinerator or, or some sort of burning process. I thought those were pretty shocking levels because uh, I hadn't really been informed that that the winds had shifted south long enough and enough contamination had made it that far in order to get readings like that. So I felt um, uh, fairly confused, as if I, I didn't have a good understanding of how much might have gotten there or how it got there or when it got there, and that they'd found those readings in March, and of course they didn't release the data until uh, sometime in, towards the end of April. Um, did you follow that part, and, and, and what do you make of readings like that? Um, yes, I followed it, and I, I am as confused as you are. Individuals have sent, uh, have sent Fairwind some car air filters from, from Tokyo, and they turn out to be one of the ideal ways of measuring radiation because uh, you know, they trap a lot of these hot particles. And we had one person sent us seven filters, and they ran a body shop or something, and, and Five of the filters were fine, and two were incredibly radioactive. So what that tells me is that the, the plume was not regular. And you'll have places where there was um, not much deposition, and you'll have places where there was a lot of deposition. Um, that same thing happened up to the north, but um, within Tokyo, uh, it seems like wherever the official results were being reported, um, didn't really represent the um, the worst conditions of the plume. And I saw that on Three Mile Island. We shouldn't be surprised that a plume meanders and that a plume um, may miss a, a, a major radiation detector by um, you know, a, a quarter of a mile, and it's not detected. doesn't mean it's not there. 
it means we just didn't detect it. Sure, it's it, this is uh, fluid dynamics. You know, when you when you put a, a drop of dye in a glass of water and watch it swirl around, obviously it, it more ends up in some places than others. So that's part of it. And anybody's looked at the uh, the aftermap of Chernobyl all across Belarus and, and and Ukraine and whatnot. I mean, it's it's obviously not a a big circle. <laughs> it's a very very um, convoluted map of of deposition. So that that's part of it. I guess I was surprised because I hadn't heard of any warning signs that that amount could have been de um, deposited that far south yet and there but there it was so um, that was pretty interesting to me what, what happened there was the plume went out to sea but then curved south and then and then west it actually c came in like a hook um, so that uh, you know when you were measuring what was happening at, at Fukushima it appeared that the plume was heading out to sea but then uh, offshore the winds took it south and then west into into um, Tokyo, um, and it contained, um, the, the particles we're picking up in air filters are you know, strontium and cesium and uh, americium, which is a, 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 an indication of, um, of fuel failures. Right, and maybe that was the same plume that I remember um, uh, was Korea, South Korea, actually shut some schools down because it was raining at the time and they had a lot of radiation coming down. So we know that there was a big south and then west hooking in order for it to get there, so maybe that was... That was part of that that one process, um, but it it speaks to something which is that these plumes that are coming up and out of contaminated plumes with radioactive particles in them are, are pretty hot, um, as you might expect. I remember the 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 reactor that was scaring me the most for a while was was number two, which looked sedate. It had this little hole in the side, but it was just it was just constantly emitting steam constantly um, for a whole period of time, and I knew what was in that steam. It was uh, it was going to be pretty hot. I thought unit two has gotten to the point where. It can't get any worse because it's now laying at the bottom of a containment, and the containment has a hole in it. That doesn't mean that it's it's not really bad. Still, it just can't get any worse. Um, the the concern uh, now is this enormous amount of water that's being used to cool these reactors. You know, tens of tons an hour, and the the original plan was to recirculate the nuclear reactor water through the nuclear reactor and on the other side have a heat exchanger that took the heat away. So you wouldn't generate any water. In fact, we've got hundreds of thousands of tons of radioactive water. And it's not mildly radioactive. And here's the problem. The, um, the, if you were to demineralize this or filter this, the filters and demineralizers would become so radioactive that they, the filters might melt because they're made of a plastic material. And the other part of it is that the personnel couldn't get near the filters to change them. Um, so it's a very difficult problem. What do you do with all of this contaminated water? The large volume and the high radioactivity make, um, make getting rid of that water very difficult. So, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to talk about the other challenges they face, too. I mean, I don't know what they're going to do with all that water, and I don't think they do either. They're pumping it into a big storage tank right now, and I just read that maybe that's leaking, or at least some water went out of it, so one guess is it's leaking. Um, talk to us about, about what are the other challenges that those engineers and cleanup crews are going to be facing. What, what's the work environment like there right now? Yeah, we are not out of the woods by any stretch of the imagination. Um, the people outside... Are, are wearing completely um, enclosed um, clothing taped to their faces, and they have respirators on. Um, the respirators are designed you know, as a charcoal filter, but they're breathing through their lungs, and they're taking the air from the outside through those respirators. Um, it's hot, it's sticky, and you're constantly looking at this radiation gauge, but um, it's something that... Um, while uncomfortable, probably isn't um, isn't lethal. The the people that are going in are are a different problem. Um, they're going in in a, essentially a bubble suit, and um, they have their own self-contained air, like a fireman in a in a fire a Scott air pack is sort of what they're they're called. So they're going in with their own self-contained air into a place that has no lights, into a place that has um, water everywhere, that, in a place that's dark. Um, with um, with rubble, and on top of that, it's highly radioactive, and they're probably carrying 30 or 40 pounds worth of gear to do whatever it is they were sent in there for. Um, the stay time in that environment, um, it, it would be tough. If there were no radiation, it's a hot, sticky, pretty mm -hmm. miserable place to work for, for an hour or so. 
but the radioactivity levels are so high that these guys are being chased out on the order of you know 15 minutes and they're receiving an exposure which is roughly equivalent to um, the, the worst an American worker would get over five years these guys are picking up in 10 minutes mm. so let's assume that that they do actually have the I think they've bumped it up to 250 millisieverts um, as a as an annual dose limit now so so once a worker gets to say that that threshold then what hopefully they they are no longer allowed to receive any more radiation um, period for the not just for a year or for a month but they, they really shouldn't receive any more than that um, here's the a general rule of thumb is 250 rem um, will will kill you so that means that if 10 people get 25 rem one of them will develop a cancer and if 100 people get 2.5 rem one of them will get a cancer so it doesn't mean lesser can lesser doses um, assure you of not getting a cancer so what these people are doing is they're increasing the likelihood that they'll get a cancer um, 250 millisieverts is 25 rem by the way I'm sorry um, but they're increasing the likelihood, every time they pick up that exposure, they're increasing the likelihood that they'll get a cancer by 10%. Right, and, and so, uh, gosh, I read some of the readings that I saw um, in, in there are pretty scary hot readings. Um, so, so they're definitely all the way up um, in the one sievert zone for, for some, of the, some of the areas, and some are hotter and all of that. So, so we've got these damaged buildings. They're sending people in. My concern has been that, you know, there are only so many people who are trained to work in those facilities, so they know them, know them well, know the systems, know the, know the parts, know how to even navigate the hallways. Um, once they've gone through and used up their allotment of, of radiation um, exposure, I, 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 they're done, right? And then I guess they train the next people to go in. And uh, one thing that's concerned me is I know that when Chernobyl went, uh, you know, Russia it just threw hundreds of thousands of people at it um, in small little bits and, and to clean that up. Here we're seeing a very different response. It's much more measured. Um, they're relatively small teams by my eye. I, I, I look at satellite photos. I don't see hundreds of thousands of people converging on that. Um, I see uh, a pretty focused response. Uh, how long is it going to take with a focused response like that um, to get this job done, do you think? The, the Russians needed thousands of people because large fragments of the fuel <coughs> had fallen on the surrounding farmland. So literally people would pick up a fragment in a wheelbarrow and, uh, and run toward where the reactor was, now throw that fragment into the reactor pit, and they were, they were done. They had received their lifetime exposure. Um, in, in this case, um, the, while the, the radiation is not contained, um, it's not coming out of solid particles that can get picked up. It's coming out of liquid. So it's a, the, the Woods Hole has already said that uh, um, the ocean has 10 times more radiation from, uh, from Fukushima than the Black Sea did from, um, from Chernobyl. So the, the Chernobyl reaction with a large staff of people it was because it sort of blew up. And the Fukushima reaction, while it did blow up, a lot of it is going down, and we're just beginning to deal with it. They're, they're importing workers from the U.S. already, and I suspect they, they, um, they will again. I was in the business. I, as a vice president, I would hire people to work in very high radiation zones. Now, we would train them for uh, two or three weeks in a mock-up, and then they'd have three minutes in a high radiation zone to do what we trained them for. And that would be their, their yearly exposure. And we'd give them a check and say, thank you very much. See you next year. Um, and that's what will happen here at, at, uh, at Fukushima. So talk to us about, um, realistically, uh, I, I mean, this is going to be months, years, whatever. It's going to take a long time. Uh, what do they do at this point? Are they going to entomb these things? Do they have to, are they required to just keep dumping water on these things until they finally cool down, capturing water all the way through? Or is there, is there some way that they can maybe just throw up their hands and, and just pour a bunch of concrete on this and call it a day? I think eventually they may get to the point of throwing up their hands and pouring the concrete on. They can't do that yet because the cores are still too hot. So we're going to see the, the dance we're in for another year or so until the cores cool down. Um, at, at that point, there's not uh, anywhere near as much decay heat and you probably could consider filling them with concrete and just letting them sit there like we have at, at Chernobyl as a, 
as a giant mausoleum. That would work for units one, two, and three. Um, unit four is still a problem because, um, again, all the fuel is at the top. You can't put the concrete at the top because you'll collapse the building. And it's so radioactive, you can't lift the nuclear fuel out. And um, I used to do this as a living, and, and, um, and Unit 4 has me stumped. Hmm. So what do they do, do you think? I think they'll be forced to build a building around the building. And then, because you need heavy lifting cranes, uh, cranes that lift 150 tons, which are massive cranes, um, to put the nuclear fuel into, um, into canisters, which then can can get removed. Um, that's sort of what happened to TMI, but all of the fuel at TMI was uh, was still at the bottom of the vessel. But it was a three-year process to get the molten fuel out of, out of Three Mile Island. Four years, actually. So um, the problem here is that all of the cranes that do that have been destroyed, on, on at least on units one, three, and four. So and you can't do it in air. It has to be done underwater. So my guess is they'll have to build a building around the building um, to provide enough shielding and, and water so that they can then go in and, uh, and put this fuel into a, a heavy lift, lift canister. Okay. All right. I hadn't, I hadn't considered that. That's a great insight. So let me summarize here. We have, we have these four reactors. Three of them have melted through. Um, one of them is... is uh, uh, unit 4 is probably one of the more dangerous ones in, in the sense that um, it's going to be years to build a building around it. It's going to be years until uh, really the situation is contained. And, and in Unit 4, though, we're, we're still concerned that in the year or two or however long it takes to, to build a building and sta really stabilize that, another aftershock could come along. Or uh, in the case of Unit 3, uh, if another aftershock comes along and um, you know, the, the pressure vessel is full of water, there's, there's a chance here that we could see um, some other event. Some, you know, that this, this situation is not yet fully stabilized in the sense that there are still surprises uh, to be found. It's surprising where the water shows up. There might still be some surprises um, left in and how the buildings behave or, or, or systems uh, hold up or fail. What else would you add to that summary? The groundwater. Uh, I am very concerned that I am hearing nothing about groundwater monitoring. We know the ocean, we know there have been leaks into the ocean. Uh, I'm not convinced that there's not cracks in the structures that are allowing this highly radioactive water to get into the groundwater. And I've been talking to people in Japan, and my recommendation there is that they should build a, a moat all the way around the reactor, about down to bedrock, which is 60 feet or 20 meters, and about uh, four and a half feet wide, which is a, <clears throat> a meter and a half wide, and fill it with a material called zeolite. And it, it, it's a very good absorber of radioactive material, and it would prevent the outward migration of any of this radiation. Um, that's not happening, and I don't understand, um, I don't understand why. So you know, we look at the buildings, and we look at stopping the, the heat and the radiation that's going upward. But there's an enormous amount of, of radioactive material in the soil right now. And um, you know, one of the prefectures nearby uh, had radioactive sewage sludge. And um, someone who watched our site is an executive in a uh, sewage business, and he said it's not uncommon after an earthquake for groundwater to infiltrate a sewage system. And that frightened me a lot, because if the groundwater is already contaminated out in these uh, prefectures, um, it could be um, the, the serious problem that is receiving no attention right now. So, uh, how, how, generally speaking, do you have a sense of how fast groundwater migrates? I mean, is this something that, that will be, you know, three miles away from the plant in um, 10 years or in 10 weeks? Um, what, how, how big of a problem is this immediately? Uh, I don't think it's an immediate problem. Uh, but I do think unless, um, uh, an, uh, unless mitigated pretty quickly, it can become an immediate problem. You know, it moves slow, but... If, if, if it's already out of the barn, um, it's going to be harder. The further out you have to build this trench, of course, the bigger the trench has to be. Um, so my goal is to, is to trap it near the source rather than let the, let the horse get too far from the barn. Okay, well, th thank you for that. Um, what I'd like to do now is I'd like to move on um, to a, a part for our enrolled members, and I'd really like to talk about what the actual impacts of this are on people. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. 
So yes, I, I'm I'm interested in, in uh, personally now much more than I used to be. I think in in really thinking these issues through. Uh, so the first thing is here's here's where I'd like to start because this is where a huge source of, of confusion and the media hasn't helped this one a lot is the difference between radiation dangers and contamination dangers uh, from radioactive particles. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, there's um, there's three kinds of radioactive um, material. Uh, there's gamma rays. The, initially, when the nuclear reactors blew, they emitted large clouds of, um, of xenon and krypton gases. Um, those are noble gases. They don't react with your skin or anything, but they emit gamma rays. So the readings you saw with people walking around with the Geiger counters were from essentially being in a cloud of gamma rays, hitting them from the outside. Um, and, and that's significant, but it's also uh, dispersed over your entire body. Um, to my mind, the bigger problem are the other two ways that radioactive material um, uh, decays. And those are called beta particles and alpha particles. Um, they don't travel as far, but they have an enormous amount more energy than a gamma ray. So if, if they lie on your skin, you're just fine. You can wash it off and, and, uh, and, and life goes on. The problem is if they get inside, they can uh, selectively go to a to an organ and um, and bombard a very small piece of of tissue with a lot of exposure and potentially cause a, a cancer and that's what we call um, the hot particle. So the all of these particles are radioactive, um, but when you talk about contamination, it means almost always that one of these particles gets attached to an organ and begins to um, to bombard that organ. So with radiation, there's three types. There's the alpha particles, which is a particle. We've got beta, um, which is a particle, and then we've got um, gamma rays. And and so I guess when we're saying radiation, it's like saying um, somebody says, uh, oh, let's talk about cars. Well, well there's Lamborghinis, um, there's, there's VW Beetles, there's Mustangs, there's all these different things. So we have to, first we have to know a little bit about that. And and radiation exposure levels, as I understand them, are set at sort of the whole body level. It says you can have so many REMs, which you could get a REM of, of alpha particles hitting, you could get a REM of beta, you could get a REM of gamma. It's just sort of a standardized way of saying, you're going to get this whole body exposure. We're just going to hit you, like when you go to the get an X-ray or something. It's just you're going to another type of radiation X-rays. So, so that's one part. But but the the contaminated particles that happen to be emitting radioactivity are the issue because they can they can localize. Um, just make it simple. We we inhale a 10 micron particle and and it happens to be radioactive. It goes into our alveoli and our lungs and sticks there potentially. Um, and it's now going to, in a very, very, very small, very close way, intimate way, be bombarding the tissue around it, uh, that particle for however long it happens to be radioactive or until it gets excreted somehow. So, so the idea here then is that radiation tells us sort of something, but very few people actually die from radiation, as I understand it. It's a very rare event because you need a lot of it on a whole body level to really take somebody down. But contamination is a whole different matter that uh, the lethal dose from contamination can actually be really small measured on a radiation scale. I'm thinking now of um, this guy Livchenko who was actually uh, poisoned. He was a, a Russian dissident and he was poisoned in London in 2006 with a very, very small amount of polonium-210. Uh, it's an alpha emitter. Um, he got that in his food somehow and uh, and then because of where polonium goes uh, uh, it, it ended up killing him I think very rapidly in nine or ten days um, considering. So, so the thing that I, I really want to um, invite people to consider is that the, the real key around contamination is to not get it in your body. That's, that, that's part one. Uh, how, how would people, I mean, how do you do that? If you're, so let's imagine, Arnie, there you are, you're living in Tokyo now, you're, or somewhere closer. Uh, how would you be behaving over there right now? Yeah, and, and actually, um, we should extend this to the, the West Coast, because we're seeing particles there too, but um, to answer your question about Tokyo, um, what, what I'm advising people in Tokyo who are there now is that, you know, take your shoes off at the door, wet dust, don't dry dust. We're actually finding that contamination inside houses is higher now than contamination outside because it's been trucked in over the last two months and it hasn't, it hasn't left. Um, and if you dry dust, you throw all of that radioactive material up into the air. I'm also advising friends there to um, um, to buy these little 
HEPA filters, um, high efficiency particulate filters uh, that look like a little round um, round device that sits on the floor, and um, and change the filters frequently. Um, we're also advising people to, um, to remove the filters in their air conditioners and in the air conditioner in their car and replace them um, because you know they pick up hot particles over the last couple months. And it's um, it's a good time to um, uh, to replace them as well. Also, telling people don't do any demolition work. The last thing you want to do right now is tear a wing off your house because you'll stir up that dust, uh, not knowing exactly what's in it. Um, you you run a risk of um, of contamination. The other things for, I'm telling friends in, in Tokyo is keep your eye on Unit Four, and uh, if there's uh, if there's an earthquake and Unit Four topples. Uh, don't believe the authorities. You know, you're, you're well beyond where science has ever imagined, and uh, it's time to get on a flight and get out of there. Don't ask any questions. Just move. What about, um, what about food? I mean, I, this is a big issue, and I would think this would be potentially an issue for people um, on the west coast of the U.S. even, is the idea that um, there are certain isotopes up there and particles that could somehow get into the food chain, maybe through milk, because, you know, cows graze a whole lot of grass and turn it into a very little bit of milk, helping to concentrate whatever was on that grass, or leafy vegetables that have a real affinity for certain of these isotopes, potentially cesium, certainly iodine, if that's still around, um, which it shouldn't be, but apparently it still is. How, how, do you, how would you approach food? Because that's one quick way to ingest things. Yep. Well, the cow milk um, predominantly would have iodine. And we're out now at 80 days, and, and most of the iodine should have disappeared because it has an eight-day half-life, and the rule of thumb is 10 half-lives. But we're still seeing iodine, which is kind of strange, and it gets back to that issue of criticality, recriticality that we talked about earlier. Um, so I'm still telling friends, to, to, until the, the middle of June, stay away from, stay away from milk and, and dairy products. Clearly, washing the, uh, the vegetables is critical. Um, in Japan, we're saying uh, avoid fish caught in the Pacific um, unless you know they're caught a long way away from Fukushima. I'm saying within 100 miles of Fukushima, don't even consider it. Um, I think that will actually get worse with time. Um, Greenpeace has some numbers that came out indicating that it is worse with time. Um, so we're telling um, the, the, the Sea of Japan is a different story. You can, pro you can probably feel safe eating fish from the Sea of Japan, but if you believe it came from the Pacific, avoid it. Um, there's two isotopes there. The, um, the, the predominant one is cesium, which is a muscle seeker. So, of course, fish meat is muscle, and, um, and cesium is uh, likely to build up in your, um, in your body if you take it from fish. Um, the other one is strontium, which would be in the fish bone. Um, so unless you, you have some kind of a delicacy that uses the fish bone, eating the fish is, is um, unlikely to expose you to strontium. So um, eventually, though, we're going to see top of the food chain animals like tuna and salmon and things like that that have th this process bioaccumulates. The bigger fish gradually get higher and higher concentrations. Um, and I am concerned that the FDA is not monitoring fish entering the United States because sooner or later a, a, a tuna is going to set off a radiation alarm at some port and people are going to think it's a dirty bomb or something like that. Um, so that's not here yet because the, the tuna haven't migrated across the Pacific. But I'm thinking that by about 2013, um, we might see contamination of the, of the water and of the top of the food chain fishes. Um, as they um, uh, on the west coast. Well, but I keep hearing the the Pacific is a really big ocean. Um, yeah, that's that that old saw has been trouted out a lot. Uh, and I think what they're missing here in in those stories, of course, is what you've mentioned, which is the bioaccumulation, which is that these are these are many of these isotopes mimic uh, really important elements, and so our bodies preferentially take them up, but so do microorganisms, and then they all get eaten by something larger than them, and so on as we go. And, and over the course of that, uh, we should all be familiar with this, because this is how mercury tends to bioaccumulate. Um, this is how a lot of toxins bioaccumulate. So we're really talking about the concentration of radioactive particles. And, and you mentioned that you, you have some assessment that um, more radioactivity has landed in the Pacific Ocean than um, than did in the Black Sea from Chernobyl. Do you, do you have a sense of how much you think has gone in? Uh, 
Well, actually, it's Woods Hole, and they're certainly a reputable scientific organization. Uh, they're saying 10 times more. And yes, the Pacific's big, um, but uh, we're still talking about what's there now. And, and I think it's important for, for everyone to understand that we're not out of the woods. You know, when Chernobyl was over, we were still 10 times what Chernobyl was over, and we're still um, have no end in sight for releases from Fukushima, and it's already 10 times that. Um, I, I am concerned. We're, we've already seen um, small fish on the order of uh, four or five inch fish as far away as 50 miles containing cesium levels of, of 10 to 50 times higher than allowable. And, of course, those fish are going to get eaten by bigger fish up the, up the food chain. So it's a concern. Seaweed seems to absorb um, iodine, but it also absorbs cesium, which is something that I just learned. Um, I was worried. I was telling people, don't worry about seaweed um, after 90 days because the iodine's all gone. But I'm not sure about that uh, at this point um, because, uh, as I understand it now, it can also absorb the cesium. So I'm a little unsure on that science. Well, uh, fortunately, the EPA has a rigorous testing program in place, right? <laughs> right. Trust me, I'm from the government. <laughs> Right. I, yeah, unfortunately on that. So so this is part of the environmental legacy of, of Fukushima. And oh, by the way, I should mention in, in, in my research, I came across um, uh, the idea that uh, shellfish, and particularly crabs and cr other crustaceans, will accumulate cesium um, pretty heavily in, in their shells. So so we might want to add shellfish to, to, uh, to the cesium story there as well. I, I think if I lived there personally, I would just be avoiding all seafood um, from the Pacific, as you mentioned. I think that's that's sage advice at this point. Uh, until and unless we had a really um, believable and aggressive monitoring program, uh, I would be personally leery myself. But well, the, can you talk to us, what, what really then are the, the health risks that you think are, are faced by those who live in, in or near the, the, the reactor um, at this point, the reactor complex? Well, there's a large plume of radioactivity that moved to the north and to the west, um, out as far as 50 miles. That, uh, I don't know how you're going to clean it up economically. You know, there, um, it's, it, there's cesium deposition higher than the, the forbidden zones of, of uh, Chernobyl, um, out 50 miles, just just in that northwesterly direction. So again, thank God the wind was blowing mainly out to sea. Um, I think it's um, it's going to boil down to does Japan want to spend the money? Um, but I, I can't imagine people ever getting back into the 20 kilometer zone, um, especially in that northeastern, northwestern quadrant rather. It just is going to cost way too much to, uh, uh, to decontaminate um, that land. Um, farming is going to be a problem out as well because, again, the, you know, cows and cattle will, uh, will absorb cesium for years to come. You know, we're seeing that in Germany after Chernobyl. We're still seeing you know, 30 years ago wild boars in Germany that eat mushrooms are still contaminated with cesium. So this is not a problem that goes away in a, a generation. You know, it, it, it hangs around for quite a while. I think the, there's two cost issues here. I think the cost, um, and it really does boil down to money at, at some point, um, the cost to decontaminate the site is probably going to be on the order of 30 to $50 billion dollars. Normally, uh, a decommissioning is around a billion to, to decommission a plant that's relatively clean. But each of these plants has got a molten blob of fuel at the bottom, which is a um, territory that no one's ever uh, assessed. And that's just the site. So I'm thinking that um, a 30 to $50 billion hit for the nation of Japan, because I don't think TEPCO can afford it, uh, as well as contamination further inland uh, could easily be a $100 billion more. Now, uh, I put that out on my website, and uh, I had people say, oh, no, it's never going to be that high. But, um, of course, it'll be a long time before we get there. And some of those costs get, might get mixed up with tsunami costs as well. But it wouldn't surprise me in excess of $100 billion um, to decontaminate that area within 20 or 30 kilometers of Fukushima would be a, a realistic number. And when we say decontaminate, I mean, so I guess you scrub surfaces, but once you've got the stuff down to the soil level, don't you do what they did in Chernobyl? I mean, what, what can you do besides carve the top number of inches off and uh, cart it away and pile it up somewhere? Is there is there more that can be done? Um, no. 
No, there's not. Um, it basically, it becomes a disposal somewhere, so it's going to go to somebody's backyard. And um, cesium is, um, is quite water-soluble, so it does move down through the soil over time. There is, again, some work with zeolite that um, uh, seems to indicate that you can lay down some zeolite and it will pull the cesium back out. But you're talking about hundreds of square miles here. Um, so this is uh, a little more than a science project. Well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really uh, still a little bit shocked that you were able to receive air filters through the mail, I presume, in some way, um, that, that came in with uh, uh, some contamination on them. And, and uh, this is something I've been focused on for a while, is, is trying to assess what the real economic impacts are going to be uh, outside of the borders of Japan. You know, a very important manufacturing industrial center, um, critical in, in certain supply chains. Uh, you know, maybe we'll find ways to mitigate that over time. But for now, they have a bunch of critical functions. And just worrying about what might happen to their import-export balance um, if, if it turns out that uh, there's more evidence of, of these sort of, you know, strange contamination moments popping up. Hey, it's in the sludge. Oops, it's in air filters. Wait a minute. It's on, you know, they don't really, it's, it's, it could end up anywhere. Um, what, do you have any insight into what sort of supply chain disruptions you might expect at this point or, or how they might manage this process of importing, exporting, given everything needs to be checked for contamination and how you would go about that? What, what's, what are we facing here? Um, well, I was a little bit surprised that Hillary Clinton um, you know, made her, uh, of some sort of a pact with the Japanese to try to encourage um, uh, buying Japanese uh, food and vegetables. Um, clearly, the, the food and vegetable chain. I think we already we already talked about. I I think the uh, the large industrial products like uh, automobiles and um, you know their transistors and computers and things like that are are probably um, going to be just fine. The boxes they're made in, I might be a little bit concerned about, uh, and uh, you know that they're shipped in. Um, but I would expect that the shippers would be on top of that because the last thing you know, Sony wants is a, is a crate load of televisions coming up contaminated because the boxes are contaminated. So I think the big guys are, are going to be alert to that, you know, the Mitsubishis and the Sonys and the Hitachis, um, and are going um, to watch that a lot. Um, it's the intermediate people in the market, the, 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 the small manufacturers, um, who um, you know, there's some clay pots coming out of Japan and things like that, um, and and I'm hoping that there'll be some kind of you know, government monitoring on that because uh, without that, I don't have any confidence uh, of what kind of product I'm I'm buying. Right. So, um, all right. So to wrap this up, I, I I'm just interested in um, uh, for all of our listeners who who may live in Japan or live on the west coast or wherever they happen to be, if there's an aftershock and if Building Four sort of topples over. What would your advice be? Um, I heard your advice to the people in Japan: um, get on a plane if possible, or get far away, or know which way the wind is moving and go go uh, the other direction. Um, uh, what would you do if you were uh, in the United States, if and that and you saw that 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 had happened? Well, I'm in touch with some scientists now who have been monitoring the uh, air on the West Coast, and in um, Seattle, for instance, in April, the average person in Seattle breathed in 10 hot particles a day. What? I yes. did not know that. <laughs> well, the, the report, you know, it's just science, so it takes some time to, uh, uh, you know, to make its way into the literature. But um, if a, the average human being breathes about 10 meters a day of, uh, of air, cubic meters a day of air, and uh, air samplers out in the Seattle area are detecting when they pull 10 cubic meters through them. This is in April now, so we're at the end of May, so it's, it's, it's a better situation now. But um, that air filter will have 10 hot particles on it. Now, um, and that was before the Unit, uh, the unit 4 um, issue. Um, clearly, you know, we all can't run south of the equator to our second homes in Rio or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. But it will stay north of, the, uh, north of the equator for anyone who has a Learjet to get out. But the, the, I, I guess what I'm advising at that point is uh, uh, keep your windows closed. Um, I, I would definitely wear a, uh, you know, some sort of a filter when I was outside. I w certainly wouldn't run um, and exercise until I was sure the plume had, had, uh, had dissipated. This isn't now. This, this is, as, as you were saying, this is, this is worst case. Um, but um, uh, if Unit 4 were to topple, I would you know, close my windows, uh, turn the air conditioner on, replace the filters frequently, uh, damp mop, um, put, 
put um, put a HEPA filter in the house and, and and try to avoid as much of the hot particles as possible. You're not going to walk out with a Geiger counter and be in a plume that's going to drive the that's going to peg the meter. The issue will be on the West Coast hot particles and. Uh, um, the solution there is HEPA filters and, and avoiding them. There's also uh, potentially some uh, um, some medical issues. Um, Maggie and I and Fairwinds have been working with a couple of doctors to uh, uh, to look at uh, ways to mitigate to help your body cleanse particles if you know you've been exposed to them. But that's a little bit premature to go into much more detail on that. Right. So, so, uh, but this is all worst case, and uh, we're just going to keep our eyes on it. I think the important message here is that uh, the situation is not yet over. Uh, it's something we're going to have to keep our eyes on, which is tricky because the media tends to not have a, a very long um, attention span when it comes to these things. But in your estimation, it, it's still an evolving situation over there. There could still be some curveballs. It's possible that you know there might be a steam explosion at three. There might be a, a toppling event at building four. These are some of the key risks we're going to keep our eyes on the lookout for. Is, is there anything else to this story you want to add? No, it's going to be a long slog. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Arnie. Uh, it's just been a, a fabulous conversation. And uh, again, where should people go if they want to follow you and find out more? Well, uh, Martinson has an O in it, but Gunderson has an E in it. So, uh, and and so does Fairwinds. F A I R E W I N D S uh, dot com is our uh, is our blog and uh, it's our website rather and uh, maggie and i are doing it for free we're not um, it, it's been uh, uh, volunteer work we do have a donate button to keep our computer whiz computing uh, but it's not for profit venture 